he's landing planes at the back, don't miss him. <laughs> There we go. Yes, the... <laughs> friends, let's join together in our call to worship. <clears throat> you who feel small and unworthy, come and worship God. God is for you, and our community embraces you. You who feel bent over and burdened, come and worship God. God is for you, and our community embraces you. You who feel unready and stuck, come and worship God. God is for you, and our community embraces you. Let us give praise to and ponder our wondrous God, who makes and loves us all. We give praise to God with our opening hymn found in Voices United 391, God Reveal Your Presence. Please stand.
person or a time that you learned something from someone in a way that you didn't expect. So whether it was someone who, you know, you normally don't think to be too wise or too eloquent a person able to teach you a lesson or a situation that you never expected yourself to find yourself in, uh, that you learned something from. So I just want you to mull over that for a bit and maybe even at the end of the service, if people are loitering around the narthex at the end, you can share those thoughts and how they kind of relate to the rest of our uh, learnings here today. So with our scripture readings, we learn a lot about acceptance and inclusion. We learn a lot about what we learn from others and who we learn from specifically. Our first scripture reading for today comes from the prophet Jeremiah, actually from the first chapter of Jeremiah. This is his call story. If you have ever even just took a little bit of a glance through some of the different books of the Bible, you will find a story about someone that God calls to offer ministry or be a prophet or do something. And that person thinks that they're unworthy, that they're unable to. And we hear Jeremiah struggle with this in these words. Now the word of the Lord came to me, Jeremiah, saying, Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. And before you were born, I consecrated you. I appointed you a prophet to the nations. But then I said, O oh Lord God, truly I do not know how to speak. For I am only a child. But the Lord said to me, Do not say I am only a child. For you shall go to all whom I send you, and you shall speak whatever I command you. Do not be afraid of them, for I am with you to deliver you, says the Lord. Then the Lord put out his hand and touched my mouth, and the Lord said to me, Now I put my words in your mouth. For see, today I appoint you over nations and over kingdoms to pluck up and to pull down, to destroy and to overthrow, to build and to plant. <coughs> Our song for today is Psalm 71, the first part of it. This is a song that even if you don't know all the words to, you'll be familiar with the first verse at least because it comes from... Um, uh, it gives the words to one of our most beloved hymns. So Katie's going to lead us in this song. <coughs> Thank you. 
final scripture reading for today comes from the Gospel of Luke. And this is a continuation of what we've heard from Luke for the past several weeks. If you recall, uh, last week and the week before, our words from Jesus were ones that were quite critical of the way that society uh, arranged itself over those on the outside, those who are marginalized, those who aren't able to participate in the ways that others can. And this is one of the passages in which Jesus takes those lessons and puts it into action through an act of healing. So from Luke 13, Luke chapter 13, verse 10. Now Jesus was teaching in one of the synagogues on the Sabbath. And just then there appeared a woman with a spirit that had crippled her for 18 years. She was bent over and was quite unable to stand up straight. When Jesus saw her, he called her over and said, Woman, you are set free from your ailment. When he laid his hands on her, immediately she stood up straight and began praising God. But the leaders of the synagogue, indignant because Jesus had cured on the Sabbath, kept saying to the crowd, There are six days on which work ought to be done. Come on those days to be cured, and not on the Sabbath day. But the Lord answered him and said, You hypocrites, does not each of you on the Sabbath untie his ox or his donkey from the manger and lead it away to give it water? And ought not this woman, a daughter of Abraham, whom has been bound for eighteen long years, be set free from this bondage on the Sabbath day? When Jesus said this, all his opponents were put to shame, and the entire crowd was rejoicing at all the wonderful things that Jesus was doing. Hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. And thanks be to God. We continue with our next hymn found in Voices United, number 361, <coughs> Small Things Count. of all our hearts be acceptable unto you, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. The healing narratives. Maybe you find them comforting, and if so, please do let them still warm your hearts and inspire your souls. The hope and joy that can spring from these passages for some are some of those faith stories that can really inspire us all. But I struggle with the healing narratives sometimes, and I think one of the things about them that always just kind of rubs me the wrong way is that so often the person being healed by Jesus, or the disciples, as we hear about in the book of Acts, 
they don't seem to have a lot of agency or identity as they're described in these narratives. They almost never get named. They rarely get a second mention. And in so many cases, we see the crowds amazed at what Jesus does, but we don't see the following scene. The scene of the person who's healed being embraced by the community, of people being able to share what lessons they've learned, and also repent at the ways that they excluded before. These are concerns that have often been lifted up by our siblings in the disability community. For those who have disabilities and face barriers to participating in society and church, many have found difficulty with the healing narratives, in part because they can and have inspired attitudes that instead of welcome and affirm, encourage us to turn our backs on our fellow children of God. In many ways, we reflect the crowds and the Pharisees that we hear about in our Gospel reading this morning. For nearly two decades, the people in town have rushed past this bent-over woman on the steps of the synagogue in a rush to get the best seats along the walls and the building. Metaphorically and, to be honest, pretty well literally as well, they stepped on the back of this woman in order to get the best views, the best seat, the earnest yet exclusionary drive to be a part of community. As a devout people of faith, there were various purity laws and rituals that limited what one could do on the day of Sabbath rest, and how one was supposed to interact with folks who had illnesses, or who society would otherwise call unclean or unfit. To the worshippers, this was just a natural thing, the way that things were. But for the woman bent over, the stigma and the exclusion weighed her down as flat as much as her physical ailment. What was normal for some was backwards for those on the margins and backwards compared to God's true ways of inclusion. In many ways, we still use Sabbath and the conditioning of our culture to exclude those on the margins, particularly those who face barriers due to not having the same abilities. We use the excuses. We say, you know, those pews have always been there, though, or well, that'll be too expensive to change, or, you know, they're just so disruptive to Sunday worship. Sabbath laws by any other name are just as sweet, or sour in this case, and make us just as likely to turn our backs on others who deserve and desire to be integral parts of our faith communities. We also need to think about how our theology, how our understanding of God, and how we worship excludes rather than invites. For as many people, our assumption is that those in the disability community are those that we minister to, rather than everyone participating in the ministry and body of Christ. Rather than listening to what the Spirit says through them, we build inaccessible pulpits and often infantilize those whose brains work in different ways than our own. Even our hymns often contain lyrics that make the skin crawl when you think about it, stanzas about being blind in faith and such. Even the hymns that I picked today don't completely hit the mark. Tom Reynolds, a professor of mine at Emmanuel College and a noted disability theologian, attributes this to what he calls the cult of normalcy in our society. Our society values self-sufficiency and productivity and can't stand the concept of vulnerability or a community. When we let our faith and our communities be led by this cult of normalcy, rather than by the expansive spirit, we not only turn our backs, but we become active stumbling blocks towards others. And this isn't a fringe issue. Data from 2017 suggests that 
one in five Canadian adults live with a disability, often facing marginalization in some or all aspects of their life. And this isn't a fringe issue to God either. In many of the healing stories we encounter, the takeaway isn't supposed to be that normal is better, whatever this cult of normalcy says is normal, or that God is punishing people. Instead, the emphasis on the healing narratives should primarily be that of integrating and expanding the definitions of community and challenging unrighteous practices that leave people on the margins. While the healing narratives spark a variety of discussions and opinions, we're called in the name of Christ to actively learn from these conversations. Stephanie Tate, an author and disability theologian who got Lyme disease as a teenager, put it this way in a recent podcast that she was a part of. So this is a quote from Stephanie. A lot of the healing stories get taught that there's something broken about this person and that Jesus came in and fixed it. And that's beyond harmful. That is not a healthy or appropriate way to teach that story. When Jesus comes and he meets people where they are, he meets them in the culture of the day. That context matters because so much of what Jesus does is he's trying to bring people in closer to himself and into better community. And so, to me, the healing stories are not about fixing the disability as if that's something that's broken. When you heal the blind man, it's not that it's so much better to be sighted and that you were broken when you were blind. It's in the context of where they were in society. So given those limitations, Jesus is doing what he can to bring you back into belonging. So within the limitations of the writing itself and the ways in which Jesus could embody inclusion and belonging, we find that in the healing world. They're not tales of fixing or tales of reinforcing ableism, but they're examples of healing community and challenging those who turn their backs and close their ears to those marginalized. And it is those on the margins that lead the charge. When the prophet Jeremiah voices the concern by saying, I'm only a child, I'm small and insignificant, I'm only such and such, God responds in word and action, you are, you are enough and you are part of my body. I know you and always have. I know what you bring to this community. You have the backbone and the support for the task I give you. Even beyond the healing narratives, we find in our entire faith heritage examples of those who serve and lead in unexpected ways when others see only barriers. The prophet Elijah was one of the greatest prophets ever known, yet he struggled with depression throughout his entire ministry. Moses was the mouthpiece of God at one of the pinnacle points of the history of Israel, and he had a speech impact. The evangelist Timothy had frequent infirmities, and Paul had a constant pain in his side that affected his health. Isaac became blind, Jacob limped, not to mention the woman like the one we meet today, who remains faithful and dedicated even with a bent back. We find the ultimate example in Jesus Christ himself, the light amongst us, the one who served and led and gave of self and renewed a community of people. He's the one who, in his resurrected glory, appeared with nail marks in his hands and a pierced side. And perhaps we've heard that phrase so much that it's, uh, we don't appreciate just how radical and visibly impactful that is. With his body and now with all of us as the body of Christ, God in Christ refuses to let us leave one another outside. God embodies the vulnerability and faithfulness that we all need to be disciples. 
Circling back to the bent-over woman, in Christ she found a release from the exclusionary practices of her community and found herself to be known and valued. A community found a wake-up call to take a long and hard look at where their Sabbath-keeping was keeping people out and how to not only embrace those others, but to take their lead from them. <coughs> Within ourselves, we're called to reflect upon where the cult of normalcy still holds us strong, where we are afraid to see vulnerability and difference within ourselves and others. In these things, dwell instead in the Spirit of God who knew us before we knew ourselves and who is always including more and shifting the margins. Within our faith communities and our communities at large, especially as our demographic ages and changes, we need to continue discerning where our traditions and resources might be excluded rather than including. This is a long process and it involves faithful and honest discussions, continuing discussions around our buildings, our worship practices, and how we understand community and outreach. They are conversations and the establishing of relationships that can and need to be vulnerable, and ones that we're at risk of getting wrong, myself included. But we're called to faithfully engage nonetheless and keep learning. And most importantly, learn from the leadership, faith, and service of our siblings on the margins. There are many wonderful leaders within the United Church with disabilities who are providing fresh insights and faith into this discussion. There's articles, there's podcasts, there's seminars, there's invitations into conversations, there's worship services, they're all out there, as well as the relationships that we can build within our own village. So let us commit to facing one another rather than turning our backs, to live in God's ways, not the cult of normalcy, to not backtrack, but to move forward in faith and understanding and vulnerability as a truly united community where all take part. Thanks be to God. Today, the ministry and sacrifice of Jesus involves the renewal of communities, the new ways of looking at ourselves and looking at others. And so it's in that spirit that I ask you to join with me in our prayer of confession and renewal. Gracious God, we need peace in our souls and healing in our world. We live in communities that create barriers for others. We live with ideals that place value and worth on the wrong things. We live in ways that foster doubt in your care and your justice. Restore us, God. May we be inspired anew as a whole community of whole people. For these and other transgressions, have mercy upon us.
people's siblings that are nice in our communities. We have lived the work that's happening here as a community of faith. Um, I'm going to encourage you to take a look at the community letter. There's copies at the back there that do have all the announcements on there. I'll just highlight a couple of things while I can. Uh, firstly, note that um, we are continuing our school supply drive uh, for the Huron Women's Shelter. You can bring in school supplies, you can bring in monetary donations for that. And we remind me it was uh, reusable water bottles they were looking for especially. Uh, so please consider bringing those in, bring them to worship, bring them to office hours on Thursday, fellowship time, the garden, whatever is convenient for you. Um, and also keep an eye out for any uh, school lunch supplies, because that will be our, minute, our mission outreach. There's a word there. Our outreach for uh, September. Uh, we'll be collecting uh, for school lunches for the uh, Chair. Uh, also note that next week, uh, August next Sunday, August 28th, there's a few things happening. Firstly, it's Camp Manessatong's 75th anniversary celebrations. So there's a whole day long thing going on over there with worship, with activities, with meals, things like that. Uh, so you can check that out, look at their website or reach out to them for more information. Also, uh, next Sunday when it's uh, hopefully by which point I don't sound like I'm doing a CBC radio show. Uh, I will be having a hymn sing service over at Hearing Me. That'll be next Sunday afternoon starting at 2 o'clock. Uh, and it would be nice to have a few folks from our faith community over there. There's several, several of our beloved that live there now, so it might be nice for them to see a friendly face or two in the crowd. Uh, so please consider that for next Sunday as well. Uh, are there any other announcements or celebrations that you share this week? Um, I have one. This is uh, still about a month away, but just mark it on your calendars. A um, number of years ago, I think it was Edgarville United, Clean United, and Bruce Field uh, sponsored a family uh, from Sudan uh, to come over and live in the area. Their extended family is now coming over and they are once again um, helping with uh, the rehoming and resettlement of um, that family. So uh, there is a concert, I believe it's September 25th, which is a Sunday. Might be afternoon, might be evening, still not sure. <laughs> um, and it will be Clinton United Church Choir, um, that other choir, and guests. So that will be Sunday, uh, September 25th. And the proceeds from that go to the um, Sudanese Family uh, Resettlement Project. So see me uh, for details. I'll also have more information as time gets closer. But. Thank you, Kim. We should all just really bring our calendars to worship and just kind of write things in this week. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> my any other announcements or celebrations or anything to be shared? No? Um, then we'll listen to our minute for mission for today. Our minute for mission is entitled, Camp Instills Confidence. Lindsay Bautour, the United Church's Engagement and Stewardship Associate, started attending a United Church camp at the tender age of five. There, she not only met lifelong friends and gained job skills as a counselor, but it also helped chart her course to eventually work for the United Church of Canada. She says, coming from a financially tight background, I'm extremely grateful for the assistance available that let my brother and me attend camp every summer. I met so many different people from different cultures and regions and got to learn their journeys and faith. I still keep in contact with many of them over 20 years later. One of my most prominent memories was with a fellow 13-year-old camper who told me that she loved camp because she could just be herself without any expectations. She said, I'm not the weird kid or the foster kid here, I'm just me. There's something I resonate with because I wasn't particularly popular in school myself, but popularity never mattered at camp and it's beautiful to know that that's a widely shared perception. 
Children come together at United Church camps across Canada to learn the gospel in a safe and supportive environment. Through campfire stories, hiking, music, canoeing, and so much more, campers gain confidence while enjoying unique activities and exploring the deep questions. At camp, kids learn soft skills like self-confidence, patience, and organizations, as well as the technical skills like music and crafting. Without the generosity of supporters, children who attend camp wouldn't be able to continue having such affirming, defining experiences. Your gifts through mission and service are deeply appreciated. Our gifts are appreciated however and whomever they are given. Uh, our offering has already been collected, but will now be
continue our prayers and words so lovingly taught by your risen Son, singing them as found in Voices United, number 960. Thank mm-hmm. you. 